right. Um, we will start the conversation today with a look back uh, at one of the original metaverses, actually Second Life. And uh, this is something that I was uh, totally addicted to. Uh, and this was very early. Uh, they started this, actually it gained popular attention in 2003. Before 2003 was, uh, they, they did a lot of work on it and uh, it wasn't as, as sleek as it is now, obviously. Uh, I had a museum there back when uh, the metaverse was still um, very, very niche. I guess it's still niche now, but back then um, it was even more niche. Uh, it was even more uh, of, a, of a geek thing. Uh, I, I was working in IBM back then. And uh, when I was working there, um, I rebuilt a lot of the servers in world. Um, and these are all obviously IBM servers, uh, slightly oversized, so it's more visible. And uh, all of these, uh, this, these include the older servers, the IBM uh, System 360. And uh, the, it also included one of the first computers, the ENIAC. This uh, is sort of the initial genesis of the current uh, sprout of metaverses, but it, wasn't the first. Uh, metaverse, the wording was created by uh, William Gibson. Uh, in fact, he popularized it for virtual worlds uh, immediately connected to what we call now um, spatial web. And uh, uh, part of that is Web3. Um, the idea behind the metaverse though uh, came very early uh, when communities online started uh, uh, creating uh, just physical manifestations. Uh, they're still doing text, but they are doing uh, things like dungeon games uh, and uh, role-playing games uh, on these uh, really old, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, back then, um, uh, uh, servers uh, that, that were, that were uh, focusing on those. One of those is basically the whole earth link, W-E-L-L. And uh, it's still online. It looks like a forum these days, but back then they uh, used the analogy of sort of a virtual world, a metaverse, even though it's text only. The current crop of metaverses uh, in that definition actually includes chat, includes Telegram, includes WhatsApp, includes all of the things that uh, we are actually uh, normally used today. Um, the analogy of the metaverse as a communication environment between people, between uh, individuals and uh, ways to create communities and societies. That is uh, the metaverse that uh, we all have in our pockets, uh, all have in our WhatsApp or Telegram links. Um, at the same time, I guess, uh, spatial web metaverses, virtual world metaverses, have appeared as well. Uh, one of the major ones is of course, crypto voxels. And crypto voxels is quite an interesting metaverse because it's one of the uh, first massively adopted one, which uses NFTs or non-fungible tokens uh, to, um, to uh, co codify the ownership of each land and codify the ownership of each NFT item. So the idea being that you can showcase your art here, real art, NFT art, any kind of art. And the world basically connects to links that show that this is a real NFT and you can purchase these NFTs. And this includes wearables as well. So these shoes, these sneakers are real in a sense because I can put them on my avatar and uh, I can basically use them to walk around. This building, this land is real in a way because the ownership structure is based on an NFT that you buy. Of course, the world itself, as you can see, it's quite big. There's a ton of things there. There's a, there's a ton of people who uh, buy land to speculate on it, uh, just uh, like in the real world. Um, empty lands like this, 
like these that have not been used and just resold and resold. That happens in real life as well. There are also lands that are slightly more lazy, no buildings created. Again, that's something that uh, is common in real life as well. Um, and uh, a lot of the lands here though, actually have function. You can have a gallery, you can have events in world. The last event, uh, like one of the last events that I've been on actually is something I hosted. Uh, we had like around 2000 uh, attendees, people who came and that was something that is that I, I would not be able to do if we were doing that event in real life. Um, galleries, uh, when you create a gallery and that gallery uh, makes big, you can get a lot more visitors compared to real galleries, physical galleries. Now, there is a limitation to this kind of work. The limitation is a limitation that I call uh, the limitation of immersibility. A lot of the social metaverses started as social metaverses, social interaction, social communication with an emphasis on actually making it social. The thing about having things that are social, but also having things that are immersive is that usually when you have social interaction, you have multiple types of social interaction at the same time. You have your real life social interaction and you have your meta social interaction which includes chatting and other things like that. So uh, the current crop of metaverses, this uh, crypto voxels, somnium space and sandbox are uh, I think having issues because they're too immersive in form in, the, in, the, in terms of graphics. Some people, some people who are metaverse uh, passionate about the metaverse like me would still do things in it and would still have parties, would still have gallery showings, still explore and, and meet new friends here, of course. But it is sort of something that is not like chat. When we're looking at chat, when we're looking at our chat boxes, that is more real because we are constantly online and we have people that we can only connect with on those chats which is why one of the things that uh, we want to introduce as well is the concept of a casual metaverse. And this is, uh, I think we've, we're one of the first crop of um, metaverses that are really focused on the social metaverse and really, really focused on making it super casual. The idea being that if it's casual, then you can put it in your pocket, if it's casual, then you can ignore it. If it's casual, you don't have to immerse yourself in it, um, but you can still walk around, uh, play around with your metaverse and talk to people and interact with people uh, while having it always on in your pocket. So the concept of the 2D verse actually comes from here. We call it uh, the 2D verse because it's a, it's a metaverse that is 2D, Web3 social metaverses as a service. Uh, the idea is to have it totally casual. You can basically stand up, walk around, uh, discuss with people. This runs on a mobile device. So it, it is a metaverse, but it also acts sort of like a chat program because uh, you can have your house there and uh, you can populate your house with the stuff you bought, your NFTs. You can put your avatar NFTs on there, your new hair, new hairdo, new, new shirt, for example. And then you can show it off to your friends. That's at the same time, your friends can do a voice chat with you. Instead of a Zoom, Zoom call, they can basically go in and talk to us on Zoom, on the metaverse. And uh, the ideas behind this, these kinds of metaverses is actually being used not just by 2Dverse. Uh, we are part of a new crop of new types of metaverses. Uh, Gather is another one. There are other uh, metaverses as well. Uh, the idea behind creating a new metaverse for the current era is uh, the idea of creating a side chain to reality uh, where you could actually still do your interactions 
in the physical world while still having a meta social interaction in the metaverse. So uh, this is actually uh, very strongly shown in the current rise of metaverses due to COVID. We're at home, we're doing things on our laptops. Um, and uh, of course, that necessitates us being on our computers and working. And not a coincidence, CryptoVoxels and even Second Life has had a huge boost in the number of users because people are online, because people are in front of their laptops, they're using their main device, their big device, their, uh, their powerful device to do it. After the pandemic, people will go back to their regular ways, which is basically using mobile devices most of the time, which means that the metaverse that is, uh, that is a side chain that is actually being used constantly needs to be very mobile focused. And that is the concept of the 2Dverse, a reality side chain, as in it's online and you're mobile at all times. It acts like a metaverse. It also acts like a chat program or a communication program. And it has all of the skills and uh, possibilities of CryptoVoxels only in a very casual environment instead of having everything um, immersed. And that is sort of the idea behind uh, metaverses and NFTs. The connections between metaverse and NFTs uh, go really deep. Even though NFTs are a relatively new concept compared to metaverses, um, an NFT uh, allows you to actually own things within a metaverse. And a metaverse has things, has land. One story that I haven't told you guys yet is uh, actually a story of why I left Second Life. Remember, I was there for quite some time. I'm just going to tell you, I was there for um, seven, 10 years, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, well, a long time. Well, uh, I was there for seven years, and then I came back uh, several times over the past three years. But like, yeah, uh, in total, I was there uh, since about 10 years ago. Uh, I kind of logged off about seven, about three years ago, which makes it like seven years nonstop on Second Life. Now, the thing is, um, I own this land, this land, this, this thing, this museum that I made. I necessarily own it, of course, because I owe, because I bought it. I bought the land. I I uh, I went to the Second Life uh, website, and on the Second Life website, I click buy land, and I chose this land and I bought it. I bought several, actually. The thing is, that is not real buying. When you're buying land on Second Life, you are actually buying it on top of your subscription, based on your subscription. If you have more than one land, your subscription monthly paid rises, which means it's not buying, it's actually renting. You're actually renting from Linden Labs, the people who take care of Second Life. And these people who take care of Second Life, they're good people, they're building a cool product, yes, but they're massively centralized. Your ownership of something is not sovereign to you. And that's something includes the land, includes the clothes that I wear, includes the very avatar shape that I've created. Which means when uh, about three years ago, I, I decided, oh, I'm gonna go off Second Life for a while. I stopped paying for the subscription because it was also getting kind of wasteful because no one is in Second Life. Uh, there's not a lot of users there. About a year after, I tried logging back in and it says my account was suspended, of course. And then I tried, hey, Second Life, uh, can you unsuspend my account? They haven't unsuspended my account. It's been years. And the funny thing is my building is still inside Second Life. This building is actually being used actively by some, some Second Life sites to promote basically tourism. This is one of the attractions in Second Life, the Museum of Computing. I built this. It's no longer mine, yet it's still being used. Some of the links still direct here. This is where NFTs come in. This is where sovereign ownership comes in. 
the idea behind having NFTs is insanely cool. Not having a third party, not having a central body control your ownership of something. Basically really having the ownership of something in your own wallet. That connection is a connection that we will explore further in this panel, Metaverse and NFTs. And, and I'd like to uh, basically call on our first speaker um, after me, um, who is uh, actually an amazing person. He's, he's been in the space for quite some time. He uh, has uh, uh, co-founded uh, Bitrees, which is uh, a company that is Metaverse native uh, before, uh, before Facebook became Metaverse native as well. Um, I'd like to call upon, and I think he's here, uh, Jonathan Heinlein, and uh, I'm going to give him um, space to speak. Go ahead, Jonathan. Awesome. Hi, thanks, Grandu. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, I co-founded Bitrees with the idea that we could establish uh, some type of business within this space that would evolve uh, digitally uh, first and foremost. Um, so my first uh, kind of introduction to this space was in October of 2019. Um, the COVID hadn't really happened yet and I was just kind of exploring NFTs and seeing kind of what was out there. Uh, and then I came across crypto voxels and crypto voxels was really intriguing to me because what I found was a property title. And this property title had rights to build and rights to own the actual piece of land that had a location inside this virtual world. And by purchasing this particular location, I could establish a foothold in this world and I could build an ecosystem uh, using this as the, the foothold. Uh, so it really kind of expanded from there. Uh, I started accumulating more properties and then I started with the, really the first project, which was building kind of this curated list of other parcels. And then I created a central portal hub. And then that kind of allowed uh, myself <laughs> who was building and, and then it allowed others to uh, kind of traverse this virtual space. Uh, so we've had a lot of fun uh, kind of building and iterating in this space, uh, testing out different business concepts. And uh, Bitrees itself is really a, a concept of a business that has really evolved into something uh, a lot more tangible. Uh, so uh, I'd like to actually uh, bring Ian up uh, to stage and talk about some of our uh, community events that we've uh, really initiated. Um, we had partnered with uh, Dow Records a, uh, about, uh, probably about a year ago and started iterating around some various concepts. And uh, due to the whole uh, COVID situation and everything, we uh, found a huge need in the marketplace for artists who were uh, struggling to make ends meet. And, you know, they are uh, trying to perform and they needed a creative outlet. And so we uh, kind of founded this Dow Drop event where we could uh, help artists uh, basically uh, showcase their work and throw a virtual event. So uh, I'd like to invite Ian up to stage just to talk about uh, some of the, the things there and, and why he's excited about that particular event. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, everyone else. Uh, I'm Ian Prebo. So I, I want to start off first with an anecdote because I remember when Jonathan discovered uh, crypto voxels. So Jonathan and I met because I was bartending at uh, a bar in Seattle and he was a regular there. And I remember he burst through the door and he was like, he had, his, he had his laptop under his hand. He had his Bitcoin hat on. It was very, very, you know, usual attire for Jonathan. He was like, Ian, there's digital land. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And here we are now. So uh, let's talk about, so you want to talk about Dow Drops. So I'm actually going to share my screen so I can show you the parcel that we, 
All right. So here, obviously, this is the the, the portal hub that Jonathan was mentioning, and, and as you can see, it's it's expanded into a quite quite a, a large place. So, Dow Drops was an uh, <clears throat> event that we started, uh, I think January two thousand one, so the beginning of this year, uh, and obviously the height height of the pandemic, and we were working alongside uh, Vandal. Uh, who is of Dow Records, and we were just trying to create live events for people, you know, uh, who work in the music industry and 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 musicians, so that we could, you know, help them make some money and also sort of bring back that feeling of of you know, live music and in a situation in which obviously there was none going on, and so. Um, we set up this, we, it's called Bitrees Plaza, and it's where we host the Dow Drops events. And it's actually gone through a number of iterations and building. And I think that we're going to talk about building in the Builders Guild in a, a little bit. And so I can actually show you, we did a, quite a number of these Dow Drops. Uh, so we're in season two right now. And all of these, uh, all, all of these NFTs here are the ones that we did for, for season one. And a lot of them sold, and some of them sold for for pretty reasonable amount of uh, Ethereum. And this project also we were using to onboard artists into the metaverse and onboard artists into crypto. Like obviously we are, you know, we at Bitrees are very, uh, you know, as they say, bullish on on crypto and especially the metaverse. So we saw this opportunity to help artists make more money for themselves and they would through traditional avenues by selling NFTs uh, and also create a community outside of their, their local community. Uh, the first, I think the first Dow drop that we released was this one right here. And of course the, sometimes the interface on CryptoVox is gonna be a little bit silly. So it looks like it's not gonna pop open. And it was with a, an artist uh, from Seattle uh, called Bone Police, and he's released. He's just absolutely jumped into the metaverse and has helped onboard. At this at this point, I think literally hundreds of musicians. He's one of the uh, organizers for what's called NXM, which is the Near Music Guild. Um, so Near is obviously another another protocol, another blockchain. Uh, so we're currently in season two, and these are the drops that we've done so far for season two. Um, and this is a little weird. Yeah, there we go. And so these, uh, these, this season, we're focusing entirely on the, the near music guild, uh, which we have all the, and this is one of the other fun things about these spaces, these metaverses is that you can come and hang out in this club and have this sort of club experience, you know, where there's, there's literally, we've got, you know, a bar with a bartender. And, and the funny thing is you can actually, you can buy a beer. You can just go in, you want to buy a beer, takes you to open sea. There you go. Where else are you going to be able to find a $2 beer these days, right? So, um, oh, and there's Jonathan. And the, 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 the sort of, one of the things that I, that I love about this is that you have these sort of 3D, almost like websites for people, right? So they come to this event, and we have all this, the social links, and those are all clickable, and people can come and literally dance on the dance floor, right? So people will literally show up, and and you know we have there's chat in crypto voxels. Usually we're also running the event on uh, Twitch, which will in, which integrates into crypto voxels, so people can watch the screen. Uh, and this this parcel is always under construction essentially, like we're always adding new stuff. So we recently added uh, this electric guitar that I designed myself uh, and then these guitar pedals. Cause I'm, I'm a musician in the real world. And so, uh, and I also added, this is, I'm actually, and I know this is sort of covering some of the building side of things, but we added this uh, bathroom, which I'm pretty excited about and just threw some NFTs in there as well. Um, so basically, uh, this initiative was just started to help musicians 
in a time during the pandemic when they were especially hurting. And a lot of the musicians that we helped release have gone on and have, have really jumped, you know, feet first into the metaverse and have released a number of NFTs and have made, a, you know, a number of, have made some pretty reasonable money on the NFTs that they've released. Um, the other thing too, is that some of them are seeing, you know, uh, more interaction with their music from other parts of the world because the metaverse exists everywhere for everyone, right? So I think that's a, a sort of a good place to start from from the, the the Dow drop perspective. What do you think, Jonathan? No, that's great. Thank you, Ian, so much. So so yeah, Ian, uh, I we met at a at a bar. I I really like going there and reading. Uh, I was uh, locked away in a shoebox, essentially in Seattle, and so I needed a little outlet. Uh, and Ian always made me feel really welcome uh, in this bar. And he had a, like this little micro ecosystem going on. They had like poetry night, and they had music and stuff like that. And and Ian was a musician, so I was just like, you know, we continued to talk through throughout the pandemic and everything. And then all of a sudden, uh, so Jason had actually reached out to me, and Jason was like, hey. Uh, can you create this piece of technology uh, for sound bites and you know bundling them together? And uh, is there a way to create a protocol around this so we can organize sound bites and create essentially an investable medium around it? And so uh, we kind of iterated on that concept, and then uh, through through that, uh, Ian basically uh, joined our team and and became the chief community officer or director of community, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, and so we've been uh, kind of iterating along uh, different ways to get involvement and interaction. And it's been uh, really quite an exciting time. Uh, so if I could, uh, I'd like to introduce Ben. Uh, ben is uh, my business partner from, gosh, uh, even before we started Bitrees, uh, we started, uh, we've met at a technology company a little kind of like mom and pop shop. And uh, I would probably, you know, not shut up about crypto and Bitcoin and kind of everything that was happening because, you know, the, the transparency that, you know, this type of technology can create uh, to the financial sector and legal sector, um, you know, something in the likes that we haven't seen in, in like a thousand years. So um, I just like to invite Ben to the stage and and talk about a, from a technology perspective uh, about this vaulting technology and some of the really cool things that uh, we can do with that. Hello, my name is Ben Getz. I've been working with Jonathan and Ian now for about a year almost. Uh, and I'm just really excited about CryptoBox. Crypto voxels and, and the other metaverses. Uh, it opens up a lot of potential. Uh, and one of one of the things we've been working on, uh, which is what Jonathan just mentioned, is um, vaulting. And so this is uh, what we call NFT wrapper, which was uh, the first vaulting technology uh, that enables you to really do uh, active and uh, universal uh vaulting of nfts uh so that you can trade them between uh each other in a more uh, uh fungible way uh the issue with uh, the erc 721 nfts and the erc 1155 nfts is there wasn't really a, a convenient and easy way to be able to transform them into uh fungible tokens and this, this was the original uh, idea for it, but it's really opened up a lot of applications on top of it. It really enables you to do things like fractionalization or even escrow swap contracts, uh, which is absolutely fantastic, especially when it comes to the metaverse, because it opens up a lot of potential within uh, ownership uh, of, of these parcels. And so some of the applications that we're pursuing is doing things like uh, setting up uh, rental agreements, lease agreements between um, 
owners of, of the parcels and uh, users of the parcels and even builders on top of the parcels who can set up uh, businesses around building out these parcels for everyone. Uh, and one of the other projects that we're working on with uh, with the with uh, CryptoVoxel specifically is what we're calling the Builders Guild, and this enables the builders within the parcels to have a unified platform for communication, asset sharing, uh, scripting sharing, and it, it's a centralized resource so that everyone will be able to uh, build in a better, more cohesive way. And individuals can even uh, set up uh, 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 like bidding and uh, just sharing of who would like to uh, set up these kind of uh, construction guilds, you might almost say. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of really exciting potential that, that opens up when, when you start talking about real functional ownership of these parcels uh, that, that you can just expand out to all of these parallel concepts to what, what I like to call meat space, because you have all these contracts and, and escrows with traditional real estate that has a lot of overhead, has not a lot of usability and usability uh, that the, the digital space can streamline and, and just enable. Uh, and so transforming the, this concept, especially using NFTs and all of these other, other toolings uh, like NFT wrapper that can integrate with, uh, with these digital NFTs is just, absolutely brilliant and so I just I just love working on on this stuff and I'm, I'm really excited with some of the other things that we've got coming down the pipeline awesome thank you Ben yeah no one of the one of the really cool concepts that I started well so I spend most of my time researching and I research uh my my kind of initial thought in this space was oh this is a property title well Meat space, as Ben puts it, has property titles. And these uh, pieces of paper um, have been used for you know about a thousand years or so as a way to organize society. And I think one of the really cool things about NFTs is it's an entirely new fundamental layer for property rights that's digital, that's transparent, that doesn't have to be verified by any third party because if it exists on the network, it's transparent and I can go look at it. I can see who owns it and I can see the various applications that are built on top of it, the different parties that are using it, that type of thing. And so for me, uh, you know, trying to dive into this digital space that you know, I don't really have a, a tangible person to interact with. All I do is look at the data and so I can look at this data and I can uh, you know, be uh, confident that you know, what I'm interacting with is something of value and, and uh, there is this kind of transparency. And so that really excited me. And it, it's definitely one of the applications for uh, this space is you know, bundling these together and creating you know, real estate investment trusts and that type of stuff. So. Um, so yeah, I think Ben touched a little bit on uh, one of the other businesses that we've established. So the Builders Guild. Um, I had no idea that uh, building within these metaverses was actually a viable business. Uh, and then all of a sudden people started requesting us and I was like, oh crap, right, well, we got to set something up to streamline this. Otherwise it's going to get too much. And so we basically set up a, a very, as Ben said, a kind of a centralized platform uh, that allowed uh, various groups of people to store their assets, use those assets, uh, but not, not only uh, storing assets like, you know, voxels or pictures, but also have the ability to import scripting and then use that scripting. And then some of the future um, use cases are uh, data tracking, very similar to the Facebook pixel, and then also uh, contract processing. Uh, because there are a ton of properties in this space 
And there really is no uniform way to, um, to ask for a build contract. So, you know, a person has a parcel, they're like, okay, I need this museum built like a computer museum or something like that, or just a gallery. And, you know, there's really no way for them to put an offer up and then for uh, builders to actually bid on that offer. And so uh, this is just one of the really cool use cases that we can do with, uh, you know, building various businesses in this space. Um, and that kind of leads me to uh, the next topic of discussion, which was the NFT Expo, uh, which Ian actually came up with. It was a brilliant idea. I was like blown away. <laughs> and he's like, John, I have this idea. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so uh, we had this gallery over in uh, Babylon and basically uh, he had an artist in Seattle and this artist is, is very traditional. She makes uh, beautiful acrylic work and uh, she's not a crypto person at all. And Ian basically just wrangles her in. He's like, Danielle, you're doing this. Your stuff's amazing. And so um, if, if I could, I'd love to have Ian just talk about uh, kind of that uh, onboarding experience and, and working with Danielle and, and basically just the process there. I believe we uh, connected uh, the uh, gallery to a nonprofit and we're able to give back through this way. So I just, I'll shut up and let Ian continue. Yeah, so let's, uh, I'm gonna do another screen share. So we're gonna do the uh, NFT XPO and it's, we've currently done one of these events so far and we're working with a couple different artists to do this again. And so, um, yeah, so I, I came to Jonathan, I had this idea, I was like, we're doing these, DAO drops where we're helping onboard, you know, musicians into the metaverse. But what if we did the same thing with traditional artists? And so I spoke with a friend of mine who had been, who had, you know, I, I'd had a couple conversations with crypto and she was like, okay, so I'm becoming interested in crypto. And, uh, and she was going through sort of a, um, some, you know, financial issues, et cetera. And so we, decided to and Jonathan actually did I, I think that the vast majority of the building on this in this gallery uh so we set up this gallery and uh we've sold actually a number of pieces um through this and so these represent some of these represent actual physical pieces of art uh and so she paints in both oil and acrylic some of them are 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 just the nft and some of them are going to be like an nft that comes with a print uh, and so we uh, went through, I went through the onboarding process with her, which is essentially like, okay, this is how we set up a crypto wallet. This is how we build a, you know, this is how you make a, a, a collection in OpenSea. And so we went through the whole process of how uh, an artist would both get into crypto and then also get into the metaverse. So I helped her connect her wallet to crypto voxels. And, you know, we helped her get a name in crypto voxels. We helped her get an outfit, you know, cause you don't want to, this is one of the fun, fun things about crypto voxels is, is showing off your, your avatar. And as, as you can see, I've got a pretty decked out avatar and some of these voxels actually I've designed myself. So uh, obviously I've got the Iron Man an infinity gauntlet and then the necronomicon from hp uh, lovecraft because i am a bit of a sci-fi fantasy nerd so as a lot of us are in the metaverse right so we uh with some of the guidance from from uh danielle built out this gallery uh and we did a, a large event in in partnership with uh a group called NFT42. They run a Discord server. So we had a, a pretty large turnout for this event. I think I think something like there was 300 people in the chat and there was the gallery was packed. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we definitely sold some of these pieces. And since the pieces sold also, like Ethereum has pumped a lot. And so she was very excited about that. She was like, wait a second, I sold these pieces NFTs for as much as I would sell a painting in a gallery. And now I actually made more than I would sell, I would make from selling a, a physical physical piece. Uh, now, some of these pieces that we sold, as Jonathan had mentioned, uh, a portion of the sales have gone to um, different uh, nonprofit organizations. And obviously one of the main ones that, that um, 
that uh, Danielle wanted us to make sure it was getting donated to was uh, the Rape Kit Action Project. Uh, so that was started by uh, a, a woman. So it's called Natalie's Justice Project or the Rape Kit Action Project uh, because there's a um, – in the United States, and I'm sure this is probably – true for around a lot of the rest of the world there's a backlog so when someone is assaulted there's a, a process in which they have to go to the hospital and get a kit to collect dna essentially and there's a backlog and so this this uh nonprofit basically helps process those those kits uh because it's obviously it's important to you know catch people who are doing these awful things but uh we wanted to make sure and so this this uh gallery now which we've we've named in honor of uh danielle who her uh metaverse name is two foot museum now whenever we sell uh, items out of this gallery a portion of the proceeds that bitry will make in perpetuity from this gallery whether it's uh the items we're selling are from danielle or not a portion of the pro proceeds out of this will in perpetuity go to uh, the the Rape Kid Action Project. Uh, because there's, we just have, you know, we we, we feel very strongly about, um, you know, as a company, and I think there's this, there's a sentiment in the metaverse of, of community and helping people out. And that's one of the things that I've really, really appreciated about this is, is how much people want to, it's, it's not just about what what you can get for yourself. There's 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 a certain amount of of self selflessness in the in the metaverse and people wanting to help and create fo and foster communities. So that's one of the things that's been amazing for me, and uh, it's really been interesting to see someone like Danielle, who who before this was not a crypto person at all, get into this and see the sort of freedoms that they that, that she can have the you know the amount of money that she can make from selling nfts and from having these events in the metaverse and now so now she wants to help out with bitries and helping onboard other artists into this pro process so you get this very organic growth of community um yeah i think that's a uh do you have anything else you wanted to talk about in re regards to nft xbo jonathan no I, I think that was about it um thank you But yeah, that I think uh, that basically does a really good high level summary of kind of what we're doing. We have, uh, you know, we started out with this portal hub and and it allowed us to um, point users in various directions. And you can actually get to our portal hub very easily. You just go to bitteries, B-I-T-T-R-E-E-S dot X-Y-Z. And then from that portal, uh, you can go to all these other portals, including, you know, this main transportation hub, which is the like the main portal hub, uh, Metaverse Billboards kind of does that. And and so we can connect to all these various uh, businesses that are kind of, you know, really sprouting out, growing here. And, and there is a lot of organic growth and that is exciting. But but the reason why there is this uh, option in the first place and this availability for growth is because of NFTs. NFTs, these fundamental little pieces of contracts, these contracts here that identify work and identify uh, creative works, uh, they really capture and, and embody the culture that is evolving here. And, and that is something that's really exciting because as Ian mentioned, uh, you know, these people and individuals and groups of individuals in this space are, are growing in a manner where they can give back and, and you know, help people and, and give to these nonprofits and, and create essentially these works of art in this space that uh, they own. And they won't have any issues with leasing it because they physically own the rights to the property through owning the NFT. Uh, so thank you, Pandu. Uh, I hope that uh, summarized what we do. We're Amazing, Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, of course, Ben and Ian as well. Um, Metaverses and NFTs and ownership. And uh, a lot of this is, of course, very serious business uh, as well uh, and require a lot of things to um, support it from an infrastructure perspective and from 
a technology perspective. Uh, I would like to call upon the director of the Octopus Network, uh, community director of the Octopus Network, Mr. Aaron Ting, to present uh, a few words about the uh, entire trend, uh, including the metaverse, the entire trend of Web3. Uh, Aaron, are you there? Hi, Bandu. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, and uh, definitely, uh, CJ, thanks a lot for uh, organizing this uh, whole thing and uh, you know to have uh, Jonathan, Ben, uh, Ian speak. Um, I've, uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I, I know we've been talking about the metaverse. And right now, we're going to zoom out to the big picture. OK, so let me share my screen. All right, so. Um, so blockchain, uh, as we know, um, enable a lot of things. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, NFT. Uh, but the other thing that they've enabled is uh, also governance uh, on chain, right? And with uh, governance in a crypto project, what we actually enable is a possibility to build a new type of business. And this business is called, uh, you know, this new form of a business is called uh, Web uh, 3.0. Um, that's how we like to summarize it. So what is uh, Web 3.0? Uh, well, you know, the difference between Web 2.0, which is what uh, we see now with, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, the other platforms, is that uh, they're company-owned. And um, in the beginning, they may um, allow a very low barrier to entry. They tend to give services for free. But normally, when they grow big, um, they would um, be more profit-focused, and they will start to, uh, you know, focus uh, prioritize on gaining more value for the shareholders. So with a Web3 model, we have a totally different model where uh, there may not be a company involved. Uh, and this uh, uh, particular platform can be fully owned by uh, token holders. And uh, in general, it is a community owned. And all the decision can be taken through uh, uh, DAO, which uh, you know, Ian mentioned, uh, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. Or we can say it's a hard-coded uh, governance mechanism where people can participate. Mm -hmm. So why Web3? Well, it's because uh, it's open, fair, and secure, and it's also pro-privacy uh, pro and uh, anti-monopoly. So we're going to take a glimpse back at uh, you know the evolution of the web. So as you can see here, um, back in the 1990s, we have a Web 1.0, essentially, which is you know HTML emails. And you know from the year 2000, we have uh, you know Web 2.0, which uh, you know, uh, also coincide with the rise of social media and YouTube, and things are just more interactive and uh, interesting. Uh, now that is starting to uh, have cracks because uh, I think the more recent issues of uh, social media is uh, issues such as uh, you know uh, data leakage, uh, uh, privacy issues, and in general, uh, there's a lot of uh, concentration of data and uh, and therefore a power enhanced with these uh, platform owners. So, um, so now we're moving towards the Web3 and why at this particular point is simply because the technology is available and uh, there's enough people uh, around. And I believe we've uh, reached a critical mass that is uh, able to, to bring it about. So these are some of the uh, Web 2.0 internet platform, just to uh, illustrate uh, Facebook, Airbnb, YouTube, TripAdvisor, WeChat, so on and so forth, right? So, um, they tend to be two, minimum two-sided or uh, essentially multi-sided. They can exchange information of value. Uh, they work on network effect. Um, and in general, they minimize friction, at least in the beginning is true. Um, and of course, uh, what they need is actually, you know, uh, some efficiency in the business logic. So these are the typical Web 2.0 platform. And as you can see, there are many, many unicorns uh, here. Um, and Web 3.0 uh, platforms are, uh, have uh, certain qualities, right? So they have uh, you know, anti-monopoly, they are able to secure the network, they allow uh, the users to uh, own and control your data, uh, and also they're interoperable. And there's other uh, advantages uh, such as uh, there's no interruption in service because you know, there's no reliance on a single central server. Uh, it is you know, permissionless and so on. So these are some of the versions that's already available uh, to show that um, you know this uh, uh, we are in the midst of a Web 3.0 revolution. Um, so there's a browser called um, Brave, which is based off 
uh, Google Chrome. You have a certain level of uh, tokenization on it. Uh, there's uh, centralized cloud servers, and we have uh, storage and IPFS as an alternative. And um, you know, in terms of uh, operating system, I, I think uh, Ethereum would qualify as a sort of a decentralized operating system. Uh, and then you have social networks, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter. And whereas, you know, in the in the blockchain world, you have uh, Steemit, and we're we're going to talk about another project called Mirad as well. So these are the kind of like a key driver. So it is quite actually quite specific. Um, so what is AppChain? Uh, the apps and AppChain is actually um, you know, an application that is built as a smart contract on another blockchain or versus app chain, which is an uh, application that is built, you know, uh, on a fit for, uh, on a customized blockchain. Um, so for, for web 3.0, uh, to basically arrive, uh, we believe that, uh, the trend, uh, is to move towards app chain because, uh, they have a dedicated, uh, bandwidth just for a single application. But these applications, of course, cannot exist in silos. They will need to be able to communicate with other blockchains. And this is where the project that I work for called Octopus Network uh, comes in. Uh, we provide that uh, you know, interconnectivity for uh, blockchain. And also one of the recent uh, development is um, the invention of uh, Substrate, which is a modular rapid uh, blockchain development framework. And this is, uh, you know, uh, at the moment is, um, one of the most capable and uh, popular uh, platforms out there. And of course, uh, we need DAO, we need the governance component as well. So, right, okay, so I'm gonna skip this, okay. So this is a summary of uh, Octopus, this is kind of like what we look like. I think the important thing is to understand that um, we are uh, basically like a hub uh, through which uh, we can connect, you know, many other chains. And this is what we look like. You know, this is uh, quite complicated, but uh, we are built on a layer one called Near Protocol, uh, which uh, has bridges to other um, blockchains and environments as well. And these are all our app chains and just the specific protocol that uh, we're using uh, to communicate with other blockchains. So it's not really important because um, in the future of internet of blockchains, uh, there'll be many different connections between many different blockchains. So at the moment, I think, um, yeah, there, there's some definition on layer one, layer two, but uh, I believe in the future, you know, it's just going to be about connectivity and possibly one of the uh, protocols uh, for communication, uh, like IBC will be popular, as popular as uh, TCP IP uh, for the internet. So, um, so why are we talking about, you know, like cross chain bridges, we're talking about multi chain networks, uh, when you know, we're in, a, you know, a, a talk about uh, metaverses and uh, sort of like the popular culture trend. Uh, this, so this is why it's important. Okay, so um, as you can see, with uh, the growth of um, you know social media such as Facebook, uh, they leverage a lot of on network effects. And within the blockchain right now, um, if if you look at the uh, the kind of blockchains that's available, most of them are not connected. Uh, Ethereum is a very you know, popular blockchain. Uh, it has a lot of uh, liquidity, uh, but at the same time, it has performance issues and it's very expensive to use. So we're starting to see a migration towards uh, other layer one blockchains, but these are mainly being connected at the moment through single bridges. And this is not exactly the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, structure that would, uh, you know, maximize the value of, uh, uh, of blockchains. So just as uh, we move from uh, local area networks to the internet, uh, we're gonna have to make this uh, you know, transition uh, within the blockchain world. So, uh, and why we wanna do that is uh, quite simply because you know, we have uh, you know, a couple of laws that people follow uh, for uh, generating network effects. So if uh, Sarnoff's law, where the value is proportional to the number of users, so if blockchain one is 10 users and blockchain two is another 10 users, so the value of a connected network would be 20 instead of 10. So these are kind of like, yeah, obvious benefits of, uh, yeah, obvious benefits of uh, connecting all the blockchains. Uh, you have Metcalf's law, uh, where your value is proportional to the square number of users, uh, and that, you know, tend to comply to like a, you know, exponential chart. Uh, but you also have uh, Reed's law, where the value of the group forming network is proportional to the uh, number of member and the number of uh, 
ease with through which uh, the group form within each other. So, so, uh, so what we talked about just now with uh, substrate, you know, being able to build blockchains easily and being able to connect to them, uh, connect them uh, easily is uh, also part of you know why we need, uh, yeah, uh, cross chain, uh, cross chain technology and also you know multi chain networks. So yeah, so network effect. This is uh, the definition uh, occurs when a product or service becomes more valuable to its users as more people use it. Uh, at the moment, uh, the full network effect is not being realized, and we hope to, you know, one day have a very efficient you know, mechanism. Now, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Web 3.0 business. So I'll give you an example. So since everyone is familiar with social media, uh, I'm going to start uh, talking about a project called Myriad. Okay, so Myriad is a meta social protocol and essentially is uh, one layer above, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you're able to um, draw feeds from your account uh, onto uh, Mira. And uh, from Mira, in, in essence, uh, it acts as a social media protocol of its own. And it has, uh, you know, certain uh, features of a decentralized uh, network, such as a DAO, and also better to storage, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, so these are some of the problems that is uh, attempting to solve. Um, the, the problem is that the uh, uh, current social media, they own and control data and the way they monetize it, uh, is not being, it's not very clear. And, uh, as you know, and also the kind of algorithms that they run, uh, you know, based on the data that they collect is also, uh, you know, prone to manipulation. Uh, so it's not only the data that we, we, we make posts on, on Facebook, um, you know, it could be, you know, how, how, how we scroll, you know, uh, where we click or even, you know, uh, to a certain extent, um, based on those inputs, they can actually, they can actually manipulate, you know, things in a certain way so that we have a slightly different political view, you know, so, so these are some of the uh, major problems that we have, right? So it's not only the data, uh, but they're also running uh, algorithms that feeds off the data to influence things. So, so these are major problem. And I think some of the, uh, there, there's a lot of literature that, uh, and, uh, you know, TV uh, documentaries that cover this problem. So what we want to do is uh, we want to put that power in the back, uh, back in the hands of uh, users and uh, consumers. So this is uh, rather complicated, but uh, this is sort of like uh, how, how it works. Um, so what Mira does is uh, they create a token, and this token is called Mira. It's a reward for the contribution to the network. And this will be given to obviously the uh, people who secure the network, uh, but also people who uh, contribute uh, by uh, importing uh, materials or, or being active. So that acts as like a currency. Now there's uh, certain ways for monetization. So for example, um, instead of the traditional Facebook model, uh, each person would have their own ad space uh, and uh, they'll be able to uh, allow advertising that they agree with to be shown. Uh, in exchange for um, uh, some monetization. Now, the key is that uh, this whole thing is clear, right? It's like, you know, when you deal with Facebook, you know, they may not be absolutely upfront or transparent about how exactly, how much value they're giving back to, to users. So, and, uh, and that I think, um, you know, has been, uh, you know, a, a big topic, especially among content creators. So if you're a regular content creator on uh, YouTube or Facebook, you're gonna realize that, you know, even if you have a 1 million hit video, uh, you may only get something like a you know you know a couple of thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars back, um, you know whereas you know the actual revenue generated from the ads shown during that particular video could be in the millions of dollars, just uh, as an example. So um, so this okay so these are the value proposition of uh, Mira, uh, the powerful creators. Uh, you can like we mentioned uh, you know draw uh, posts directly from other social media. I think this is one of the, the key things. Um, one of the reasons why many social media uh, platform fails uh, is uh, they, they're not able to, uh, well, draw content, uh, they have a lack of content. And uh, also at the same time, I think it's very difficult to get, you know, one's friends, all of, uh, you know, the people that we, we follow to, to move to a new platform. So by using Miria, you don't necessarily have to abandon the platform. Uh, you can just have an alternative where you aggregate all the information and still remain accessible uh, to all the traditional social media. 
Um, so yeah, so this is actually quite an important statement. We give control to users, not algorithms. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot more control um, that happens. And okay, so this is the advertising, the ad space that we mentioned. And obviously uh, you'll be a transparent marketplace where all the data is uh, visible. And uh, yeah, and uh, we can take a so-called fair share uh, of it, whether it's 5% uh, or 10%, uh, the platform fees, uh, those five to 10% platform fee will still go back eventually to uh, the token holders. That's, that's kind of how it works. So, so, um, so this is, um, yeah, there's a couple more slides, but I won't go into it. Um, this is actually quite important. Um, the, the value chain, uh, the network effect activation, um, but this is the end goal, right? So the end goal is to have a, a web 3.0 business where it is governed, uh, it is decentralized and is governed by token holders uh, through a DAO. Uh, that's the main thing. And we believe that if this, um, every single web two uh, business right now today uh, will have, eventually they will have web 3.0 competitors. And the biggest web 3.0 competitors uh, can generate as much, if not more value than a web uh, 2.0 uh, competitor. So this is what we believe. And easily, uh, you know, we can replace this model with anything else, right? So for example, uh, if you have uh, iStock photo, for example, we can have a decentralized iStock photo, right? If we have, uh, you know, an entertainment portal for K-pop, for example, uh, we can have the same, right? And with the power of NFTs, in fact, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the celebrities, I think, uh, and also you know major uh, sport franchise, they have already uh, discovered the power of uh, you know blockchain and uh, NFTs, right? So for example, um, I believe uh, NBA Top Shot is a is a collectible, uh, it's a baseball card on NFT uh, essentially, and that has generated uh, millions of dollars and so right, even for one particular like NFT, and that trend I think is just going to continue. I think. Um, Probably the bigger brands would start to notice this, including uh, K-pop uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, and the, the thing is that uh, it, it's more than that. That's what I want to say, you know. So for example, if we launch a metaverse, which is uh, let's say, you know, for example, crypto voxel, I think crypto voxel people have to understand that is actually a blockchain enabled app. It's not really a decentralized app because the game in itself is centralized, uh, but you know, you have a, they, they obviously use blockchain to tokenize some of the items in the games. Uh, yeah, and uh, some of the marketplaces are not centralized, uh, decentralized as well. Like for example, OpenSea is not uh, decentralized. So you have, um, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, how to say, um, yeah, this world of like, you know, blockchain, you know, apps that serve, uh, you know, crypto and blockchain world, but not, uh, not all of them are in this, should be in the same category, right? So. So what I believe is that, um, yeah, this particular uh, web 3.0 structure can be applied to uh, another metaverse. So I'm hoping maybe Bandu, uh, you know, would, you know, uh, yeah, would uh, actually implement a 2D city in this uh, form. That would be quite interesting. And that is uh, already, uh, I think, one step ahead. So yeah, so in short, this is kind of like uh, what I want to get across. And if you remember um, what we spoke about earlier, it's all about, you know, um, yeah, um, moving forward to, you know, the internet of, uh, of blockchains, but also at the same time, when we have the internet of value, uh, we also want a new new type of business to be built on top of it and to actually, you know, uh, realize the, the entire value of uh, the technology. So one last example that I want to give is uh, actually, yeah, these are some of the benefits of, uh, you know, uh, which we've already explained. But uh, yeah, what what I uh, want to one example that uh, actually struck me as quite uh, powerful is uh, when um, a decentralized exchange called Uniswap managed to uh, generate as much volume as Coinbase, the largest exchange in North America. Uh, when they reached that stage, Coinbase had uh, more than a thousand employees, and Uniswap, I think, at that point, had five employees. So this is the power of you know automation. This is the power of you know uh, you know a web 3.0 business model, and this kind of like uh, you know improvement in efficiency uh, is really 
you know, um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't happen in every field and uh, not too often as well. Yeah. So I believe there's tremendous amount of opportunities, uh, whether, you know, um, you know, anyone comes in from any side of it. Uh, I think Pandu came from, uh, you know, like an enterprise side of it. You know, some, most people would discover it through NFTs. Some people would discover it through privacy coins. Uh, I think it doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, the main topic, the, the one that, uh, you know, everyone should actually be focused on uh, is actually Web3 and the Internet of Blockchains. Yeah. So I hope more attention will be paid uh, to that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Aaron, and that was an amazing presentation. Um, the connection between the metaverse and social interaction is actually something that needs to still be explored. Uh, there are many things now uh, that are uh, locking us in our own houses uh, and uh, not allowing us to travel and not allowing us to meet our loved ones in some cases. Uh, but the thing is uh, the metaverse allows that in, in ways that are super different. Um, but that also means that the metaverse is upgraded. It's not just, um, you know, another game. It's not just uh, another way to interact. Even it is almost um, um, an analogy to life. And we, when we have analogies to life, something that is analogous uh, to the way we live, we need to ensure that the security is there and the sovereignty is there as well. Uh, the sovereignty of the ownership. Uh, making sure that you actually own this building and not some company. Okay, um, I think we also have JJ, uh, JJRD here. Uh, he is a photographer and uh, I'd like uh, JJ uh, to give a quick overview of um, what is it like to be an artist, a creator within these uh, NFT marketplaces and even within the metaverses. Um, I'd like to give the floor over uh, to JJ for his sharing. JJ? All right, I thought that was him. Okay, so uh, like we can still wait for JJ in that case. Uh, we can actually open this uh, for um, more of a discussion. Uh, we can have a, a more of a panel structure while we wait uh, for JJ to come in. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, have all of the speakers uh, open their cameras, uh, turn on their cameras rather. Uh, Ian, Jonathan, it's optional for you. I, I know you don't like cameras, but like Ben, Ian, uh, Aaron. And uh, yeah, and then we, we can have a really quick discussion about what you think. Um, and this is, this is uh, of course, everyone has a different view of what uh, the future is going to be. Uh, but uh, what do you see in the next five years for uh, the, the joint technologies of metaverse and, and NFTs? Uh, I'd like to start off from Jonathan. Wow, so uh, hopefully you still hear me. Uh, so I think NFTs will enable uh, more transparency and it's going to reduce the barrier to entry for uh, people looking to identify their creative works and also uh, create a business. Uh, and the metaverse provides a very low barrier to entry because you can establish a global location uh, from anywhere and you can reach your target audience in a manner that, that uh, is really palpable um, to end users. Because as you say, uh, you know, even though it is virtual, the experience is such in a way that you feel like you're next to that person. So I, for me specifically, uh, I'm always pacing and walking around. And I don't know if you noticed that in the metaverse, if I'm like talking and whatnot, uh, I'm also pacing and talking and moving around and that kind of stuff. So uh, for me, it kind of, uh, you know, mimics that that real world uh, experience that uh, you know so many of us has been uh, missing out on for the last couple of years. That's amazing. Um, and Ian, I'd like to hear more about uh, you as well and the future of uh, performance art in the metaverse. Uh, what do you think? So I think first and foremost, we're at such a, uh, we're at a point where it's still we're all early adopters in the metaverse, right? So I I think that what we're gonna see in the next five years is significantly 
more adoption and more artists and musicians moving to these platforms. Uh, and I actually want to talk about uh, one of the events that we have coming up that Beatrice is one of the sponsors of, which is the Metaverse Music Festival. We're throwing a three-day festival in CryptoVoxels, Somnium Space, uh, De Decentraland, and it's all of these artists and musicians that have in the in during the pandemic been onboarded into crypto and into the metaverse are now getting together to throw a crypto and metaverse centric music festival. Yeah. And yeah, and so it's like another example of how the metaverse mirrors meat spaces, you know, as, as Ben likes to call it, uh, where you know, you have these large music festivals right, where people come and, and see all these artists that they really appreciate. And there's all these different stages that are going concurrently. And we can do that. We can mirror that sort of real world experience in the metaverse, but it's, it's, it's even, you can have it be as large as you want because there's no physical limitation, right? Because we have multiple metaverses now, we can have multiple stages, right? So there's this like, I, just this massive, you know, decentralized uh, festival happening. And um, I know that we're, we're, some people are organizing certain stages via genre and some organizers are, are, are organizing stages via like communities. So one of the stages that we're working on is the, the NXM stage. So the first, day of the NXM stage is all going to be the people who have done Dow drops. So mm -hmm. it's like sort of a built in reward of being in a part of the community is that then you get to be a part of this live, you know, music experience. Right. right. So it's, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go over to Ben and uh, slightly change the question. Uh, we've talked about the future of metaverse. What about like the future of like, Metaverse technologies. Um, I know a lot of people have been talking about AR, VR. Um, what, what do you think uh, would be like the game changer for the metaverse for it to have like even more massive adoption, Ben? I, I think ease of entry is the number one thing to get into uh, re really any new technology, especially when it comes to Web3. Uh, right now, if you're not really familiar with blockchain uh, and, and you don't know what a wallet is or you don't know what Ethereum is, it can be really difficult to get an onboarded into the metaverse. And so I, I think part of it is just wider adoption of uh, Ethereum. If, if the metaverse is based off Ethereum um, or, or whatever blockchain uh, and ease of entry into that is, is really step one for mass adoption. And then step two, likewise, is ease of adoption within the platform itself. Uh, one of the benefits of Metaverse is that uh, there is the potential for infinite space. And so in the real world, we, we see overcrowding and just overpopulation in a lot of areas or even just market speculation that can make it extremely difficult to get into real estate. But within the metaverse, uh, you can have these high value areas that are, that are concentrated, um, but you can still make sure that there's always room for everyone to have their own slice uh, of freedom or, or home or, you, you know, or artistic freedom or whatever. Uh, and I, I think that's really awesome being able to, to have that. Uh, and then just the other side of it is being able to allow people to share with their own communities uh what they're doing in the metaverse in in an awesome way uh i think i think if, if we can get to those points where we'll really see mass adoption awesome and uh yeah and right now with all of the blockchains that are, that are coming in uh there's there's a lot of chains now it's not just ethereum i think ben mentioned that sort of and uh that's as i go and ask this same question to Aaron. I'd like to also hear from Aaron, um, the future of metaverse in a multi-chain world. Um, what do you think, Aaron? 
Well, actually, I think uh, you, you have to answer to that because uh, you shared with me uh, an idea once, I believe, that uh, you want to have a different metaverse on different chains, sort of like a parallel universe. But essentially, you know, uh, yeah, a user will be able to choose, you know, uh, you know, from the same interface, like which chain they would like to access, stuff like that. So I, I think that's a pretty cool idea for the future. Um, yeah, but I, I think for overall adoption, uh, definitely like a few things need to happen. I think um, like if you look at the amount of uh, downloads that MetaMask have, I think it's about 8 million downloads. And that is, you know, if that is the, the total number of people using uh, DeFi, uh, then it's not very encouraging because, you know, it's only a fraction of like the total people in the world or the total people who has uh, access to internet. And in fact, I think in major markets, uh, especially like uh, Korea, I've spoken to some friends, uh, a lot of the crypto traders, they're not on DeFi. Uh, they're still trading crypto on centralized exchange. And I think that um, uh, that also means that, uh, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're not big into metaverses yet. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, fragmented markets. Uh, I think we have to bear in mind that the guys we're talking to here, like, you know, Ian, Jonathan, Ben, they're really at the forefront of uh, what's happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, definitely, you know, we need uh, a super easy to use blockchain that's uh, user-friendly. Uh, near protocol is, uh, is actually a pretty good one for beginners. Um, you know, I've uh, managed to onboard some friends. I, I think opening account is uh, as easy as, uh, uh, registering an email. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think cross-chain technology actually, you know, has to improve quite a bit. Um, there are various chain, uh, types of, uh, you know, cross-chain bridges, uh, either it's trustless or uh, trusted. Um, and uh, depending on the architecture of the, you know, blockchains that's connecting to each other, uh, they, you know, may take very long uh, to settle or they may not be, uh, you know, as secure as uh, we, we like them to be, right? Um, so that's another challenge. And if you can imagine, like if every single blockchain is uh, being connected into this internet of blockchains, we also have a very big issue of security because uh, each one of these chains would have a different level of security. And if you can imagine, you know, if you're crossing, you know, a particular asset from chain A to chain B and from chain B to chain C, if you know chain B is somewhat compromised, then uh, your asset you know on chain C would essentially be compromised as well. You know, so so there's a lot of um, you know I, I think we're we're quite far away. Um, you know I, I think we have the sort of like you know enough technology to build a very basic version of the Internet of Blockchains, um, but I think the understanding of you know uh, you know blockchain technology and you know kind of like, uh, you know, establishing standards, you know, kind of like at least, you know, to, to the consumer, right? Uh, there must be a standard for which, uh, you know, everyone is comfortable with and accepts. Uh, I, I think that may take a very long time. Uh, but I think, I think blockchain uh, can also uh, progress, right? So there, there is a idea that, you know, when you have a blockchain, like for example, Bitcoin, uh, you can't really move away from Bitcoin um, and that is, you know, partly true. Uh, I've seen projects that have been built on, let's say, a chain that is, uh, you know, outdated, and they decided to update their technology, and it's what just wasn't possible if they, you know, uh, didn't entirely move to a totally new blockchain, and uh, that has happened. And, you know, so we do have a situation where people do token swaps, you know, uh, et cetera, but, you know, for, for blockchains to update themselves, it is possible uh, if you're, uh, either your forkable blockchain, like very old types of chains, or if you're a newer chain nowadays, uh, especially Substrate, you can just update as you would, you know, update your uh, firmware. Yeah. So um, um, all in all, I think um, the main driver uh, would actually be uh, sustainable business models. Uh, I think I think this is um, this is something that uh, you know uh, that has to be. Well, more understood, I think, uh, probably we'll, we need a few more examples of uh, really successful ones. But I think this ha has to be really understood. Because as far as I uh, know, uh, there's a lot of interest from the traditional world, right? So if we're talking about the, you know, blockchain going mainstream, uh, it also means that uh, a lot of the institutionals or uh, major corporate companies, uh, they will want to adopt the technology. But normally when they do, uh, they also want to do it on their own terms. 
So uh, I'm starting to hear about, for example, uh, uh, bond issuance, right? So there's a lot of talk on DeFi and mainly it's based on cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum and other uh, currencies. Mm -hmm. And we look at the total liquidity of the crypto markets, so maybe around, you know, uh, $2 trillion right now. Um, it's it, 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 it looks big, but uh, it looks big, but uh, actually, you know, compared to the traditional financial world, it's just you know, uh, it's merely a drop in the bucket, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what I think uh, will probably happen is uh, a lot of these uh, uh, corporate institutional will actually come in, and uh, if they understand what is a Web three, you know, business model, uh, that makes it a lot more uh, uh, a lot more encouraging, right? Uh, why is that? Right. So, for example, if you have a company like, uh, you know, uh, Kakao, right, or even, uh, let's say, Facebook, I think Facebook did mention that they want to have their own metaverse. So, you see, they, they are noticing what's happening, and uh, they are not going to, you know, stand by and do nothing about it, right? Uh, if there's, a, let's say, an airline uh, in Malaysia, AirAsia is quite popular. If uh, AirAsia understood what it takes, right, to, to build a sustainable Web3 business model, uh, they would definitely, you know, want to do it on their own terms. So I'm guessing probably their own blockchain. But more than that, uh, I think they would also want to do it within the regulatory framework. So, for example, in Malaysia, there is um, um, there's going to be an IEO license. Uh, I'm helping one of the applicants. So IEO license just essentially means, um, you know, it's a it's a terminology that the, the Malaysian uh, regulators uh, decide to use, but it's essentially like an ICO, like a token offering uh, platform. But once this, uh, you know, licensed token offering platform launches in Malaysia, what that enables is for uh, traditional corporate companies to launch their own tokens. Now, why would they be interested? Well, it's because these tokens can represent anything. As, uh, as you know, uh, in, the, in a traditional financial world, Companies always need more capital. Um, companies always, you know, want more, you know, uh, uh, adoptions, customers. Okay, and uh, when when it comes to the tokens, what it offers them is something that is uh, not available before, because a token can represent practically anything. So instead of uh, having a token to represent a share in a company, they could have a token to represent maybe a share in a particular piece of equipment, for example or a particular, yeah, particular rights, you know? Um, and they may be also able to tokenize, um, especially if you're an airline or your hotel uh, group, uh, you also may be able to tokenize like uh, your reward points program, for example, right? So, uh, so these are the kind of uh, things that I imagine would happen. And I think it's gonna be uh, very much different than, you know, what we can imagine at this point in time. So I think we're a bit early. But uh, we only need one or two big success case uh, before everyone understands and uh, fall in. So I think definitely within five years time, my hope is that, uh, like, I hope this understanding arrives sooner. And I hope that, you know, uh, the regulation would, uh, would be able to, you know, uh, be put in place at a faster rate. And definitely, you know, five years from now, I, I think, you know, just having tokens in a crypto wallet is no longer something strange. In fact, I, I think it would be very much a part of you know, what someone would have, uh, you know, in your, uh, yeah, when, when you're managing your finances. Thank you, Aaron. That was amazing. Um, and thank you for actually mentioning uh, what uh, you said about the concept of a multi-chain metaverse. It's no longer just a concept. Uh, it is actually uh, something real that we've done um, uh, with the team multi-chain metaverse where you can load NFTs in from multi uh, chains, <laughs> from several chains. And uh, when you walk from one place to another, you can basically have different wallet logins uh, come at you. Uh, you can edit, you can put in new NFTs uh, from hopefully any metaverse. Currently we have, we have one, uh, but the other metaverses can be supported as well. Copying this, then pasting it here, then loading. The idea behind a metaverse is uh, to, like the original idea was to create a way to show information. And uh, that's what Vermal was uh, like. That's what started uh, the entire thing. 
and uh, you import NFTs like this and put them in, that is also showing information. That is also a new way of showing things. Um, and with that, basically the connection between the NFTs and the metaverse become very clear because NFTs are being shown on metaverses and a metaverse can show multiple uh, NFTs from different chains, different technologies put in together. We just need to make sure that the metaverse itself is decentralized. So I have a question and this is a quick fire round because we're running out of time. And the quick fire round is based on a bit of news I heard uh, a few weeks ago that Facebook is setting up its own metaverse or well, well, what they said, what he said, Mark Zuckerberg said was basically um, Facebook is a metaverse company. Um, so let's respond, uh, two sentences max. Let's start with Jonathan. Jonathan, your response. Perfect. Yeah, I think I think Mark Zuckerberg's understanding of what's evolving here is nascent, and uh, he has a lot of catching up to do. Okay, then what do you think? Zuckerberg likes to build closed off systems and bring everyone in and, and force them to use it. And I think that's the antithesis of what the freedom the metaverse can provide. Ian, what do you think? Yeah, I'm gonna echo sort of what Jonathan and, and Ben said and that uh, Facebook inherently is too centralized for the ethos of the metaverse. And Aaron, what do you think? I think it's a big mistake they're making. Um, I think in the end of the day, um, it's just going to bring about more awareness about metaverse, and people are just going to, you know, realize that you know there is a decentralized version where you know you have your own control and you have your own power. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, second question: um, Do you consider? Um, do you? So do you consider uh, the social media, uh, the mainstream social media that we have today as also being sort of a metaverse, uh, sort of a lo-fi metaverse? And uh, if so, if so, why? If not, why? Jonathan. I think uh, what we're currently, currently experiencing here is an evolution in the internet, whereas the internet is essentially a two D representation of cyberspace and the metaverse is a three-dimensional representation of cyberspace so what has not been technologically possible is now and we will see it evolve around us as AR and VR applications become adopted okay Ben same question what do you think I, I think that they're analogous, but I don't think we could classify them as a metaverse because there there is no ownership there is no freedom. I think uh, standard websites are more of a metaverse than, than these sorts of communities. Okay, okay. I actually had a conversation with a guy on Twitter about this. Uh, he was still doing well, uh, the whole Earth link, uh, and uh, he was adamant that they're metaverses too. Anyway, Ian, what do you think? I mean, I can understand why people would, would think that those are a metaverse. I, I, I think that there, there is a certain feeling of of physical locality that 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 needs to be associated with a metaverse, right? So I can, you know, I in, in crypto voxels, I can physically go to a parcel and it has a, it has a location, right? Whereas, and maybe I'm thinking too much in terms of you know meat space and 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 mirroring that in the metaverse, but I do think that there there needs to be some sort of analog to reality, if that makes sense. Okay, okay. Aaron, what do you think? Same question. Yeah, Next I mean, uh, when, when you talk about metaverse, uh, um, I think you, there, there's an idea of uh, having an avatar, um, you know, and I think as long as you don't have that, it's quite difficult to classify as a metaverse. Uh, maybe there's some components to it that, uh, you know, can basically be related to it, but uh, yeah, uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Um, another another round. Uh, what do you guys think about the metaverses that are copying real life? Like 
uh, real Earth, uh, uh, what was it, Earth 2, uh, and several other metaverses that have cropped up. Um, is that a yay or a nay, Jonathan? I, I think uh, that space is still evolving and there is some technology that will come to the surface here shortly that will displace that. Ben? I mean, I, I love diversification when it comes, comes to the metaverse, I think. Uh, anything that comes in will be able to bring new ideas and new experiences. And I think that's, that's always good. Awesome. Ian. Yeah. Again, I'm going to sort of echo what, what Ben was saying and that um, I, I'm just interested to see what they have to offer. I think that there's a lot of room in the metaverse for, for different applications. And I, I mean, what I'm most looking forward to is, is the incorporation of, AR and meat space. So I can post mm -hmm. my NFTs in my house. That's what I'm looking for. That's, that's actually what I, what I was talking about. Like that a lot of these uh, new metaverses are promising that uh, uh, a physical or a digital layer on top of physical space. Yeah. And I'll, I, you know, like I'm looking forward to that and I'll believe it when I see it. All right. Uh, Aaron, I have, uh, I can, oh, sorry. I, can I build oh, off of what Ian said? Yeah. 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 So, I, I think something that's really cool that you can do within a space like CryptoVoxels, for example, is CryptoVoxels to me was, was really the correct architecture because I didn't have to do anything with blockchain in order to hop in the world. I simply just hit my you know, HTML and I'm in the world. So it's quite great from that you know, user experience. Um, also, some things that are really cool you can do is you can create replicas of real world experiences and you can create a portal into the real world and a portal into the metaverse world uh, using essentially Twitch or other video streaming services. And so you can actually create this portal in between the physical and digital space already with the technology that we're adopting. Okay. Aaron, what do you think? I think um, during the pandemic, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, had had to make a major adjustment. Um, you know, when going physically, being present at a meeting, and uh, you know, going to, you know, visit, you know, um, yeah, your parents' home, or maybe, you know, even the, I mean, it's, it's quite gruesome, but maybe the cemetery and how people is being remembered. I, I think all that has changed. Uh, I think, and uh, I think that, um, yeah, there, there's an opportunity really to, you know, try to understand, uh, you know. Yeah, how, how we're experiencing this new world, how we're, you know, uh, are gonna, you know, basically, yeah, I mean, stuff like memorial and stuff like that, I think it's quite important. Uh, I think, you know, uh, a lot of that, you know, it has to be, has to be uh, thought about. And uh, perhaps uh, I think there, there should be a, you know, a, a well accepted, you know, a way of uh, doing things in, in these certain areas. So I was just thinking, you know, uh, Facebook memorials, right? So recently, like, I had a friend who passed away, and um, but everyone is uh, talking about, you know, should should we like on Facebook, you know, should this be a memorial and stuff like that? Uh, mm -hmm. So no matter what, I, I was just thinking, like, it, it's always going to be just a, you know, archive account. Uh, that's what I think. You know, it, it doesn't really, you know, represent um, other anything other than what the person is willing to post. So when you talk about like, um, you know, the metaverse, right? It's like alternate real reality, right? Uh, avatar yourself living in this, you know, uh, environment, virtual environment. But let, let's say that, you know, this particular virtual environment is one where is widely accepted and, you know, most of the people we know are in it. Then uh, I think, you know, sort of like, you know, these social things that, you know, we take for granted uh, in the real world, I, I think, you know, probably a, yeah, a version of what's like, you know, accepted would actually emerge in that particular metaverse. I think that's probably, you know, when uh, it'll get really interesting. Um, yeah, when it's, you know, fully accepted. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so adoption, uh, basically. I'd like to jump over to a topic that is more NFT than metaverse. Uh, this is actually something that was mentioned by Jonathan, uh, NFT fractionalization. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, not just NFT fractionalization in general, but uh, what are your thoughts of like the future functions of NFTs, not just metaverse related, any function? And uh, what are you most excited about? Jonathan. 
Wow, that's a, it's a expansive question. Uh, yeah, NFTs, uh, like I kind of touched on, they're a foundational layer for how we organize society. And uh, you know, this type of technology, uh, we have had a physical version of that uh, for you know the last thousand years or so in regards to paper. Uh, but now uh, you can replicate that exact same logic and internalize the execution of the contracts themselves to the NFT. Uh, and so uh, just you know that right there uh, really has a lot of ability to disrupt uh, you know current mm -hmm. systems. And, and from that, I think we will have this emergence of a very uh, exciting ecosystem. Awesome. Awesome. I'm excited about that too. Um, I'm going to switch it up a bit. Ian first, what are, you, what are you most excited about, about the future of NFTs? Oh, Ian, you're yeah. on mute. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. What am I most excited about the future of NFTs? I mean, I, again, I think it's it's the integration of, of NFTs and meat space, right? Like I want, I want to see augmented reality and like, I want to have my NFTs, you know, on my, and not just like a, like, I want to be able to put on some, some sort of, you know, glasses that I can then actually physically see my NFTs. So like put them on my walls, like I have paintings. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge William Gibson fan. So like there's, there's some of his books, like, I think that the most you know, prescient person for uh, for the for Web three has probably been William Gibson, right? Coining the term metaverse, like the I think it's the book Ida Rue is is the one with um, or no I can't remember, but um, you know like he wrote a lot about augmented reality before it was even you know a a, a dream in in most people's minds. All right, um, Ben, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm I'm really interested in in, in kind of the, the practical benefits that an NFT can can provide. Yeah. Okay. What are what what kind of uh, benefits uh, do you have in mind? Oh, I I, I just I think uh, taking these uh, kind of uh, traditional concepts uh, that were that require trust and. Uh, uh, human interaction that can kind of be automated away using NFTs uh, as kind of like a single source of truth, um, like doing uh, property ownership. Uh, if, if we can parallel property ownership in, in meet space with, with the metaverse, I think that that would be fantastic. Awesome. Um, and uh, Aaron, uh, what are you most excited about about the future of NFTs. Remember, this doesn't have to be a metaverse. It's just NFTs in okay. general. Okay, in, in general, well, NFT can represent anything. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited because, uh, you know, I mean, we, we have a very traditional understanding of sort of like a, you know, object and owner. Uh, now we can have like an object and multiple owners and with certain NFT protocols, like the one Bitrix is uh, developing, you know, we can fractionalize NFTs. So, so all this is very exciting. Uh, but there's a, still a very big gap between, you know, before this law, right, which is what we operate by, where if you're the owner, if the NFT is in a wallet, then you technically own it. Uh, if not, you don't. Uh, versus like the real world, you know, legal system, like, you know, how we, you would determine like property ownership and the ownership of the NFT. And there's also issues where, you know, if you have, you know, someone who passes away and, you know, and they did not, you know, for example, you know, um, you know, uh, let your family know, next of kin know, you know, how to access the wallet, you know, if they did not set up this mechanism, uh, then, you know, there, then that, you know, is, uh, well, that property is essentially lost, right? Yeah. So, so there, there is, uh, so I'm very excited to, uh, to see, you know, how like the legal system is going to absorb this, are they going to create like a whole new space just to, you know, fit NFTs in, uh, so on and so forth. So that integration, I think, would be so exciting for me. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, next to final round, not the final round yet. Like it's a penultimate round. Uh, I'm gonna ask you all different questions. Uh, Ian, what do you think the music industry is gonna be like on the metaverse? And uh, will the record labels, the major record labels, uh, follow follow us in, or will they use the Facebook metaverse? 
I'm so I think that NFTs are the future of music, like hands down, right? And so they're going to have to, right? If they they, if they want to stay in existence, they're going to have to. They don't, you know what I mean? Like this is whether or not people want to move towards blockchain and web three and NFTs, this is the, this is the future. So whether we see it in the next, you know, three years, five years, or 10 years or 20 years, like it is going to be the future We're we're, this is the forefront right now. And so if they want to stay viable, they're going to have to. Okay. Ben, um, what if you had the other Ben, uh, the uh, the guy who made Crypto Voxels, or any other metaverse designer, Somnium Space Sandbox? What would you tell them about their metaverse, uh, and uh, what would you suggest they do with these metaverses? Well, I mean, start- yeah, I think uh, there are just some basic general. Uh, technology uh, best practices that kind of need to be implemented. But the metaverse is, is also borrows a lot from traditional game design. And so one of the things that I'm noticing with crypto voxels is that the way they're doing uh, like object calling uh, is, is not super effective. And so if you, if you move away from say two parcels that are adjacent that are built up to be one unit, uh, a lot of uh, NFTs can disappear, even though you're still within the render distance. And so there's there's a lot of assumptions being made with culling, but I, I think there's other uh, general performance uh, indicators that can be improved in terms of like asset minification uh, or anything like that. Okay, yeah. Erin, um, uh, what, would you say uh, for like, what would you say for people who are out there right now and they're uh, keen on creating their first NFT project or their first metaverse project? Uh, what would you suggest to them? Um, and what they, what should they do? Okay, so um, I think it's two different things. Uh, so if you want to create an NFT project, I think the current trend is to release uh, very simple, um, how do you say, illustrations, like uh, an ape or something or a penguin. And uh, yeah, and uh, try to get that going. Um, I think I think the key thing, the key concept is that it's a community. And, and mm-hmm. when you buy these NFTs, it's not like you're just a buyer, but you become you know, part of the community and you can access uh, certain groups and stuff like that. It's very much a, a cultural thing. Um, I, think, I think that works. Um, you know, um, and if you want to build your own metaverse, I think it's not something that is uh, easy. Um, I, w- I would reach out to, you know, someone who has the concept of actually, you know, deploying multiple, uh, you know, uh, metaverses and uh, try to work with them so that you don't have to worry about, you know, the NFT engine or, you know, hiring the developers and stuff like that. Uh, but definitely, you know, there, there are a lot of like different blockchains and there's a lot of unexplored concepts uh, that, you know, no one has tried before. Uh, so I, I think that that'll be, you know, something really exciting, you know, an explosion of metaverses and, you know, the projects connecting them. And, you know, if we are able to find sort of like, you know, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, you know, the way forward uh, for all of us and, and reach a stage where, you know, maybe, you know, there may not be a single winner, but uh, definitely if there's a, we're accepted norms, just like how, you know, how you know everyone almost well, almost everyone has a Facebook account, uh, whereas you know when it was at MySpace kind of stage, not everyone has a social media account. So maybe we'll reach the same stage of uh, metaverses, where sort of like you know everyone would have sort of like an avatar on uh, this particular metaverse, and I, I think that's that'll be super exciting, and uh, I think the, the world will change uh, for good. Thank you, Jonathan. Um... What do you think about the crossroads between NFTs and finance? Like if there's a banker listening to this from Oxford, uh, what would uh, they need to look into in terms of NFTs? Wow, that's okay. Um, so 
uh, as far as banking goes, I mean, banking is really a simple concept of locking something in a vault and issuing a uh, token uh, representation of that. Um, so that can be simply automated away. Uh, and then everything built up around that can also be. Uh, and so uh, it really, it comes down to the incumbents adopting this technology quicker than it's being evolved from. Uh, and so it's slightly uh, parallel economic systems kind of evolving and iterating together. Um, and so it's gonna be really exciting to see uh, this crossroads on, on who ends up being, uh, as Aaron puts it, uh, winners. Awesome, that's, that's a lot of parallels there. Um, all right, we're at the ultimate chapter of our discussion today. There's only nine minutes left. And I am actually just gonna give these nine minutes to, for each of you uh, to give your closing thoughts. Uh, we're gonna start uh, from Jonathan. Sorry to put you on the spot again. Um, and, uh, you know, um, just a few words to, to close this off and uh, conclude from your end about your thesis about the metaverse and NFTs. It starts with Jonathan. Perfect. So I think the metaverse uh, creates a brand new world of creative thought where we're able to uh, recreate, uh, you know, current systems that uh, have only benefited a very small few people. And now we can design them in a manner that benefits everyone. Um, and so I'm extremely bullish about uh, the opportunity to integrate NFTs within society and the various systems that will evolve from that. I was on mute, sorry. Uh, Ian, next. So I think, uh, again, I'm gonna echo some of what, what, what Jonathan is saying, is that the metaverse and NFTs, one of the things that, that this provides us is uh, a way to get away from gatekeeping, right? And I think that that's a, a huge step forward because you know, we, we see so many hurdles to people getting, you know, financial independence and owning, you know, real estate, et cetera. And so there's, I think, a, a lot of opportunities for for people to get into that, right? And to not have to deal with these gatekeeping and centralized institutions. Okay. Um, ben, again, in closing thoughts, Metaverse and NFTs, go ahead. I, I mean, I just think it's it's pretty revolutionary. This is what everyone has been talking about and wanting, uh, you, you know, for decades now. Uh, uh, Ian mentioned Gibson, uh, and you know, this was originally popularized in, in science fiction literature, and and people have been talking about how the, the internet itself has been the first iteration of this, uh, but it really hasn't come to fruition until we're talking about the web three, excuse me, until we're talking about the web three metaverse, uh, which really is, is the ultimate expansion of this. And then I, I guess the next step after this, which is still probably decades away, uh, and, and I don't know if is technically feasible, is in, you know, full VR where you are completely uh, invested in, uh, you know, kind of like uh, how, how they're doing Reddit Player One, where it's it's entirely within this virtual metaverse, uh, completely self-contained, would be I think the next next big thing. Awesome. And Aaron, uh, closing thoughts: Web three metaverse and NFTs. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a um, you know um, such a good time to be alive, uh, where we can see actually see a distinct. Uh, you know, technological phase, uh, just starting this, um, you know, just starting. Um, I think that, um, you know, what, what I hope for the metaverse and the NFTs and Web3 in general uh, is that, you know, um, you know, the understanding of Web3 business model would improve and we'll start to see more sustainable business models. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a game called Axie Infinity and they have, uh, you know, coined something called play to earn. And there's thousands of people in Philippines that do not have a job you know, because of the pandemic and they're spending their time, you know, uh, playing game, you know, but they're not playing game for, for fun only, they're playing game for a living. And I think that's actually possible in the metaverse when once we have, uh, you know, enough people and once we have this, you know, quite novel, you know, web three business models, uh, 
you know, being applied. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, for, you know, people who's, you know, less fortunate, maybe geographically, you know, like they're in a country where, you know, things are just not, you know, as, uh, as developed and maybe not as rich. Um, I, I think, you know, ultimately that, that's what the metaverse uh, will be able to provide. I, I really like what Jonathan said about, you know, having a system, a new system where it's not only a select few that uh, gets to succeed, but, you know, everyone has sort of like a equal opportunity. And I think uh, ultimately uh, that's what I want to see. And because of this, you know, um, emergence of Web3, you know, NFTs and metaverse, like everything combined, you know, and not only that, uh, like the regulations are, 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 are catching up. Uh, they're slow, but they are catching up. So, so I'm, that's why I'm super excited. And I really hope for a future where, you know, even if you were born in like, you know, possibly the worst country in the world, but if you, if you have an internet, if you're willing to learn and if you're literate and if you can contribute to, you know, uh, society, you know, as, as a person uh, in any way, whether you're an artist or, you know, or, uh, or a programmer, or, you know, you're just a community guy, you know, who likes to organize things, you know, uh, yeah, and, and, and especially important, uh, I think something that we haven't touched on is uh, those who are physically uh, incapable, okay? Mm. So not everyone is, um, you know, is, uh, you know, as lucky as us, you know, some of, you know, people are handicapped. Uh, they may not have the ability to find a regular job. And I, I think that, you know, just uh, unleashes that potential because when you're an avatar, like you don't have to be a handicap, you can be just like anyone else. And that, that part, I think, uh, is so exciting and so meaningful for me. And I certainly hope that it's going to come true sooner uh, rather than later. Thank you. William Gibson said that cyberspace is a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation by children being taught mathematical concepts, a graphic representation of data abstracted for banks of every computer. A consensual hallucination. That word is interesting. It provides a root of consent, allowing us uh, to give consent before sharing. And that is something that's sometimes missed. The metaverse, today's metaverse, with NFTs built in, is a metaverse of consent. It has social immersion, it has discussions. It has friendships. First time I met Ian was in World, in Crypto Voxels, right? True story. That, true story. That sense of realism is there because we own it, because it's a consensual hallucination that we choose to be in. It is a mediation of reality between us and real reality, but it is true for us because we choose to be in it. And with that, I close the session. I would like to thank Aaron Ting, Ian Prevo, Jonathan Heinlein, and Ben Goetz uh, for being here. And I would like to thank the committee uh, from How You and uh, Kellogg and Oxford uh, for the opportunity uh, to present about metaverse and NFTs. I've been Decentricity, AKA Fandu Saswardeo, and uh, I'll give it back to the committee. Thank you. Okay, so All you right. There. Uh, are you there as well, uh, Yeah. Uh, so yeah, should we end it here? Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a good, have a good rest of the day and good night. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Uh, uh, Sunny, would you have to? Uh,